This is SciBite, episode 95, for May 28th, 2013. everyone, and welcome to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast, fresh Tuesdays over at jblive.tv, well live I should say, and then fresh for download on demand over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey Heather, happy science to you. Happy science. All right, what are we going to talk about today? Today we're going to take a look at bilingualism, cancer cell mortality, one smart dog, bringing Mars to Earth, spacecraft updates, curiosity news, and as always, take a peek back in the history and up in the sky this week. Hmm, I must say, Heather, that does sound like a plethora of science. Let's kick it off with the news. All right, where are we starting tonight? All righty, bilingualism. I had to make sure this was actually a word <laughs> when I went to try to type it. So everyone, you know, it's a commonly said old wives' tale science that if you learn two languages when you're a kid, you're automatically good for all languages the rest of your life. You like e learn it way easier. Okay. Well, this is one aspect of that that this research looked at. So according to this, people who learn two languages in early age seem, seem to be able to switch back and forth. Like, they're two different quote-unquote sound systems. So... There's different ideas about why, you know, how the brain would process these two different languages when you learn it when you're a kid or when you're young. One says that the speech in one language, uh, then it can switch to a whole different mode. So it's just like, and another view says that you adjust the speech variations themselves that they kind of recalibrate. So it's all kind of weird. It's all about how your brain can switch between the two. Is this kind of going along the same research that I know you've covered on the show before where they've discovered that when you reuse a certain path in your brain over and over again, it sort of like develops um, more like an e like the brain is a better capable of, of using those those pathways? Is that kind of what this is? Like if you establish those early on, then the brain is able to use them forever? Or what is this? What is it about this process that 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 is sort what of... they're looking at here? Yeah. I mean, what is it about learning two different languages that sort of alters the brain? What is it? Well, here they're looking at like what kind of alterations there might be, and it's like the sound, not so much like the, when you think of a different language. A lot of times you'll think, you know, the words, the grammar, you know, is you know, or the sentence is backwards to what you're, you know, what you're used to saying or whatever. And it's one thing that you don't always think of is the sounds themselves. Hmm. Like, um, I think of it because my name is Heather. The H and the TH in a lot of different languages don't exist or sound really different. So my name gets said in a whole bunch of different ways when I'm talking to someone that is English as a second language. Right. Or, you know, what I run into all the time, like like all the time, is pronouncing open source projects on the Linux Action Show, which maybe the person who created the project is in a different country, speaks a different language. Mm -hmm. And I say, I say it, I say Ubuntu, and they meant Ubuntu, Oh, or Ubuntu, and uh, or you know, or it could be a ba or a da, or some kind of like little difference in just the smallest thing. And I've always just said it one way because that's how we say it in English. And yeah, I, I would, you know, I struggle with this all the time. Yeah, I mean the this is one study that they went uh, pa and ba. Okay, so now everyone just say ba, and the whole thing is in English speakers, you start vibrating the vocal cords like the moment you open your lips. So like, and now everyone looks up and tries to say ba. Ba. <laughs> and try to like coordinate and see when it says. And Spanish speakers actually start um, making the vocal cord vibrations slightly before they open their lips. Oh, wow. So it's, so they used, so they had a group of bilingual participants and they said, all right, you're going to be hearing rare Spanish words in the other group, you know, and then they're going to say, all right, you're going to be hearing rare words in English. And they recorded these this totally written uh, Bafri and Pafri, B-A-F-R-I and P-A-F-R-I. So they did it with variations of the same two non-real words. 
And so some of them they gave with the pronounced slightly different, giving like the R, the slightly Spanish pronunciation. And then people would hear them. And depending on whether they were told it was a Spanish word or an English word, they would perceive those sounds differently. So they would agree when they put people, you know, you're going to be hearing a whole bunch of English words. They actually act, you know, they said, all right, they're going to hear the words in one specific way. And then when they were in Spanish, they heard it kind of in a different way, even though it was the same thing. They could huh. hear the difference between them. Huh. So it was just the way of the sounds themselves. It's, you know, they say it's like um, when you're talking to someone in English with uh, English second language and they have a really thick accent is because they're working with different sounds that they're sort of smooshing into the English language or whatever your local language is. Hmm. So, you know, like, you have. I should probably yeah, so, get, I should probably get my kids learning another language is what you're telling me. Uh, it's, you know, it's hot. The whole thing is being able to have that sound system, essentially. It's, they'll be able to say the words and the vowels and things very easily in that specific language that you get them into. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a give and take because any other language, it'll still be the same where it's, as anyone learned it as an adult. Now it's, you know, so it's just that time where you're learning what sounds make up you know that your language and how you smoosh them together to make words right so it's you know i made up a thousand and one different languages when i was a kid yeah (laughs) it's like i did and my little fingers would talk to each other in different languages and they made sense in my brain and everyone looked at me like i was crazy but that's okay so it's (laughs) So to me, I could make different sounds more easily than some people I know. Because hmm. like, I was like, oh, that sound, I can make it. But it's kind of funny because when you think about it and you look at all the different, you know, you look at even the different uh, vowels and consonants from different languages. Some of them are like really different. Like in uh, Russian, uh, I was like, not that sound in English. Right. So it's, it really is that where it breaks it down. So it was, it was I found it kind of interesting that you, it's not normally something you think right away when you think of language is that just the sounds themselves. Yeah, that would be the hard, well, probably the hardest part for me, to be yeah, honest. I mean, yeah. I, I could see how if you learned it early on, maybe just then relearning down the road, you're, you're a little more used to thinking that way. But for me, that would be a very hard transition. Yes. Heather, very good, very good. Any other thoughts on that one? No, I don't think so. All right, well then, uh, speaking of learning the languages, let's learn a little more about our own language, right? Ha ha, you get yeah. it, you get it? Yes, yeah. I'm talking about our pick this week. Heather's got a fantastic freaking pick. Now, a lot of times we have something on here that you could watch, because, come on, everybody loves something to watch. Every now and then, though, and this is the one, these are the ones I really, really love, is we have an Audible pick. And Heather's come yes. through this week with an Audible Star Wars book. Yes. The Path of Destruction, huh? Yes, about uh, Darth Bane. Oh, I'm going to, oh, Darth Bane, huh? Here, I'll yes. play a sample from it. We'll see what it sounds like a little bit. Part one, three years later. Chapter one. Dessel was lost in the suffering of his job barely even aware of his surroundings. His arms ached from the endless pounding of the hydraulic jack. Small bits of rock skipped off the cavern wall as he bored through, ricocheting off his protective goggles and stinging his exposed face and hands. I love how a lot of these Star Wars ones have additional sounds added. Yeah, right? radio drama style. Yeah. Uh, Shane Kufel in the chat room says that he's also uh, got picked up this book and likes it quite a bit. It's 12 hours. Yes. And yeah. it came out uh, October of last year. This one also supports the Whisper Sync, so it'll sync between multiple devices. So if you have like a tablet, smartphone, you can you can listen on one and it'll resume on the other in the correct mm. position. Oh, nice! Yeah, and uh, we'll have a link in the show notes. If you grab it with that link, and it's your first Audible book, you'll get it for free. And then you can Yay. keep it even if you cancel your Audible subscription. And uh, I'm gonna pick this one up. I'm gonna definitely add this one. This is yeah, awesome. There's- there are some connections to already uh, from the Dark Forces books and games if you've ever played those with uh, Kyle Katarn. So there's like direct connections with 
the overall story arc. It's about 2,000 years after the MMO, KOTOR. Oh. It's out right now, but 1,000 years before the movies. So it's kind of in that general like um, middle ground. Yeah. But yeah, I was totally listening last night, and we had to stop and force ourselves to stop going, oh, yeah, we have work in the morning. <laughs> we got caught up, and we kept being like, one more chapter. One more chapter. That's fun. That's fun. That's what I love about these audiobooks, too, is you can do other stuff while you're listening to them, which is yeah. nice. So if you want to, you know, sometimes actually I'll do the dishes. Sometimes I'll play a video game. It just kind of depends. And uh, when you when you got 12 hours to fill, it actually goes by pretty quick. So yeah. go check it out. We'll have a link in the show notes. And if you use that link, you support the Jupiter Broadcasting Network because we get a little affiliate sign up when you uh, join. And uh, Heather... Uh, with that pick also, uh, oh, don't forget, also, by the way, we'll have the general Audible link at the bottom of the Jupiter Broadcasting site. Uh, you can always just click that. But Heather, with our picks done, that must mean, I would guess, it's time for the News Bite. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about in the News Bite? All righty. New research actually suggests that a compound abundant in the Mediterranean diet takes away cancer cells, quote, superpower to escape death. So what it's doing is this very specific step in gene regulation, and it's de or sort of re-educating the cells so that they're more like normal. Okay. So but there's like two ways of like splicing or modification, how RNA works sort of it, you know, sp you know splits up to continue breeding essentially or you know, continuing on its life. And cancer cells actually have two types. So they, you know, one that happens in a normal cell, and then the cancer cell is a second splitting type to sort of trick, um, trick the body and keep it alive and reproducing longer. Mm. So what this specific compound does is it goes, off, goes in there and shuts that second one off. So it makes them more, essentially, they're saying it makes them mortal again. So that you can kill them easier. <laughs> so it's, it's like uh, it's like it's like this uh, super fix. Yeah, it kind of sounds like a, it sounds like a magical fix a little bit. Yeah, is it legit? It's, well, any of these stories, you have to go. What is it? I have um, in the show notes. I have uh, Media Link, which uh, XKCD. It's a online sort of comic, and it's you know talking about you know every time there's you know some science cure in a petri dish. And there's a little scientist standing on his chair pointing a gun at the Petri dish, petri dish <laughs> saying, uh, yeah, bullets killed them too. So, yeah. so it's one of those things where it's very promising. And, you know, it's this sort of a thing, uh, apo apogee and whatever it is. I can't say it now. <laughs> uh, the thing that's in like parsley and celery and chamomile tea. Oh. So lots of fruits and vegetables. This is one of those things where if it... It's kind of promising in that I hope it works mm -hmm. because the uh, drugs have a very, you know, single specific what they're doing. This sort of has, you know, it works that way and it has all sorts of other benefits looking towards uh, anti, you know, anti-inflammation type thing. Oh, okay. So it's going through and okay, what yeah. they said is the production of it is actually helping, you know, stop that and. So it's kind of, they said, uh, sorry, that it restores that, you know, single splicing in uh, breast, uh, breast cancer cells or all sorts of different things. So it's kind of makes them more sensitive to chemotherapy. So it's not something that you, you know, you eat celery in your cure. Don't right, do that. Right, right. <laughs> don't do right. that. That's not don't, an anti Don't think that that's going to work. Right. <laughs> no. It's one of those things where it may be a good, you know, supplement or, you know, to work with. So that's that's kind of awesome. Any of these things are very promising, and yeah. I, I like them. But I saw that comic and I kind of laughed and went, "Yeah, we get a lot of these. You see a lot of this, you know, hope for a cure for this or that. It's sort of any step that says this can help cure X by doing Y is great. It's just each little step, and I hope everybody says." You know, this works or that works or, you know, tomatoes have the super, you know, or super fruit and eat that and it's good for you. There's all these, like, uh, yeah, uh, Kent in the chat room, eating healthy, exercising, good prevention for, you know, generally and good for health. 
So right, this right. this is a specific thing where perhaps if it actually works this way, can they develop a drug or develop something to identify and you know get this specific gene, you know, get this epigenin and, and modify it in such a way that it, it can just take you know a pill or a more focused, more concentrated version of it. So we'll see where it goes. It's very in a way, so I'm, I'm hopeful on it, but also kind of one of these where it's X in food. So it's, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes those things get overstated a little bit. All right, cool. Well, something else that uh, kind of fits in with our first story when it comes to speaking languages and understanding grammar and things like that. Sounds like dogs might have a leg up on me. Yes, well, not necessarily on you, but so there is a nine-year-old border, border collie who has actually demonstrated the grasp of basic grammar. So like two ball take frisbee and two frisbee take ball. And it knows which like to take the ball to the frisbee or the frisbee to the ball. Over here, Chase. Over here. So, Find a toy. Find a toy, girl. Find a toy. Well, that doesn't Find surprise me. Yeah. yeah get pop up so it's toy. like this. This is a dog that sounds like a, a thousand different words. So it had training up to yeah it has more than a thousand different words and they were they've had tests where they put a whole bunch of toys out where the dog knows Good the toy, name of Papa. it Good girl, that's a and toy. then they have one toy that the dog <laughs> doesn't know oh. as one like and they'll have one toy the dog doesn't know the name of and this is like by process of elimination the dog is like retrieved the unknown toy it's like oh I know that's a ball I know that's a frisbee I know that's a chicken huh I don't know what that is that must be what you're calling for and this is like a crazy smart dog. And it's actually one of those times where they're using the experimentation or the all you know, the different things that this dog is doing to sort of learn about early language learning. Yeah. Well, this isn't, you know, I had a Border Collie growing up and the Border Collie knew every single person's name in the family. So you could say, yep. bring this to dad and she would bring whatever you wanted her to bring. Or you could say, oh, she even knew the pets, all the other pets' names. So she knew the cats' names, the horses' names. Uh, (laughs) She knew everybody's names. She knew people that came over frequently. So that doesn't surprise me too much that, that, you know, uh, you could train a dog like that. Because I think she knew the name of some of the specific toys too. But what I find to be interesting in that whole thing is that process of elimination aspect of it. That is, you know, I mean, kind of shows a higher level of thinking a little bit. Yeah, so that's part of what they're, all the different tests. I've seen a lot of different stuff with this uh, with this specific dog, Chaser. And uh, Ken in the chat room again. Not This is maybe not be considered, you know, actual proper grammar. And they're still <laughs> trying to figure out, you know, did the dog, um, you know, understand exactly what's going on? Or, you know, exactly. A lot of people, you know, have seen that kind of a thing with their dog. It's one of those things where... It's interesting how much are they able to grasp and what is that telling us about how children or how, you know, learn language when you're young. It sort of gives you an idea of like, dog can learn it this way and learns all these different words. A thousand is a lot. That I was very impressed by. Yeah, I think that's more than me. And the fact that the process of elimination, (laughs) more than you. Yeah, I think so. I think think I'm about 500. Uh, Okay. (laughs) Use them all up in, in any given show. Right. <laughs> I can't do any more shows. I don't have any more words. Oh, no. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Maybe somebody out there has a dog that has 2,000 words figured out. That would be amazing. Yeah. All right. Should we move on to the two-byte news? Let's go. All right, band, hit it. All right, so no. uh, the band is really fired up tonight. I'm not sure why. They seem to be in a pretty good mood. They seem to be yeah. in a pretty good mood. They brought in a little barbecue, too. Ooh, they did. They did. All right, what are we talking about in the 2 by news? All righty, a year on Mars on Earth. I'm sorry, what? So, yeah, so we're it's another one of those research you know, experimentations where you, where a group is saying, let's do a Mars simulation here on Earth. Right. Now they've had it before, you know, a lot of people know of the Mars 500 where they stick or they stuck some people in a isolation 
and they just left him there for a year. And the Mars Society is actually doing something like this in the Arctic. So it's in, Can in Canada's Devon Island. Very cold, very up there. You know, you have to train with um, shotguns to in case there is a polar bear <laughs> that comes wandering up. And it's not to kill the bear. It's now, to hopefully scare it away. This is my kind of Mars. And now I'm down. All right, this is Mars I could live on. Yeah, so, but, and they're saying, you know, that their specific simulation is different from everyone else's is because they're actually going to be doing science. Okay. You now they have a mock um, spacesuits with, you know, gloves and a helmet. And, you know, so they'll have to be going outside and, you know, the suits are heavy and cumbersome and they're trying to do science and they're going to be alone way up there. So that's going to be the stress and the isolation. And so what they think it's a more accurate representation of a, of a simulation because it is, because they're doing more of the things that you would actually end up doing they're on gonna have They're going to have a task-based schedule and they're going to have to yeah. get certain things done and have deadlines and et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. That has seemed like a little more realistic, doesn't it? Yeah. This is, it's really interesting. I've seen them. They've had a couple of these missions before. None of them have, most of them have been a couple months long in the summer. Now, this one is actually going to be the entire year long. So it's actually going to include the cold of winter, which I was surprised at. But they're going to actually Brr. include that, yes. That's going to be a so, little rough. Yeah, and they'll do some more information on it, you know, crew selection and different things as, as time goes on, trying to find people who could, you know, fit the bill for what kind of science they need and can disappear to the ends of the earth for a year. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and not lose it. Yeah, that's probably helpful, too. Yeah. All right, well, why don't we do a spacecraft update? All right, what do we got? All righty. Kepler, our exoplanet hunting telescope. Yeah. Over the last, you know, week or, or two in, in science, we may you may have heard sad news that Kepler, it has three, um, it launched with four different rotors. I don't remember the, the proper name of them right now. And it's used to help aim the telescope very precisely, which right. is what you, you need this extra precision to locate, you know, all those dips in these stars because it is so faint. It has to be very, very precise locations. One of them failed last year and they needed three. So they were working on three of them. And then another one failed last month. It came back online momentarily and then it went it dead again. So they're, there's no real repair service. They don't have the shuttle. So they're looking at possibly end of mission and what to do from there. And can it be used for other purposes? And now they're trying to strategize about is there a possible way to sort of remotely repair one of them? So they're going to try both. They've got, um, they're going to, it's going to take several weeks before they can actually put this command system together and they're going to have beam commands up there and see maybe if doing a specific set of jobs or tasks can actually kind of kick one of them back online. Hmm. So it's sort of a long shot, but why not? Why not give it one extra try? Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, that it'll be the same point it is now. So I mean, they are looking for other ways that they can use it in case it doesn't actually come back because it's still good. It's just not as you can't aim with such a pre precision that you need. So we do have an upcoming, you know, uh, exoplanet hunting telescope. That's they're planning right now for 2017 launch. Oh. Yeah. So it's going to be a little while. And this one isn't necessarily looking for distant planets and sort of a wide scale like Kepler does. The uh, transiting exoplanet survey t satellite tests is actually going to be looking at the bright nearby stars huh. to be able to kind of see if they can look at the atmospheres of those planets. Oh. So it'll be less sensitive in the fact that it can't see far away planets and make, you know, the three, you know, almost 3,000 planets, exoplanets added to the list of knowledge. Mm -hmm. But they're hoping maybe they can look at some of these closer ones and 
use the sunlight or the starlight fly, passing through the, the planet's atmosphere in order to be able to uh, peer into that and see what the atmosphere is made of. That would be very interesting, wouldn't it? Yes. Just a little peek from far away. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, very cu- very cool. Now, I, uh, I believe we have a little update on opportunity, don't we? We do. Curiosity seems to take up all the headlines. But no, opportunity has been there for ever and still trucking along. Yeah. Now, it has just made the discovered the strongest evidence to date for it for an environment favorable for Martian biology, which means Mars bugs. Very Ooh, horrible. really? Yes. So what they did is they've actually confirmed that they supplied this type of clay that is actually with neutral pH water. So most of them that they've most of the rock that they've seen so far in opportunity has contained a lot of alumina, a lot of silica, and you know, lower levels of calcium and iron. Pretty much all of it they looks like in a highly acidic water. You know, that kind of formation. But this new rock they've actually seen is shows that it's actually fairly neutral water. So it would be the most favorable that it has ever seen in its life. And they actually looked at it by using the uh, rock abrasion tool. It is a little tool that has like essentially like a little scouring brush that they can lean forward and uh, scour away some of the rock, which I can't believe it's still going. Yeah. I was just thinking like, how does that not break down? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it would sort of wear down over time, but they, it's still good enough that they can kind of scrape away some of it and then take one of their, very precise um, sort of a microscopic cameras and then lean that over, press it up against it and take some, you know, uh, X-ray spectro- spectrometry, spectro- use the X-ray spectrometer, spectrometer camera. Yes, I cannot speak today. And so it's kind of interesting. They actually had, you know, they spent 20 months of, si- of you know, of, a, of the expedition circling around what they call uh, Cape York, this low ridge. And... They actually committed several weeks to measuring this one specific rock, which is quite a long time for it. They're trying to head to a a different little mountain. They're going to a different hill slash mountain called uh, Esperance. And they need to get there in time for winter so that they can tilt up in order to catch uh, all the sunlight they can through the winter. Because they'll so that'll be their parking spot. And they really need to be there in order to survive the winter. So anything between here and there, has it has to like hit above a certain priority science in order for them to slow down for any specific Gotta be really worth it because they're on a deadline. Yeah. So this was definitely worth a little bit of their time to stop and, and look and investigate. Interesting. And they got the science they needed. And so now it's move on and truck to the next location. But it was really interesting that they were actually able to finally find some pH neutral water is like, hey, this was just drinking water type water hanging out in that rock. Wow. And again, it's, it's just amazing that uh, it just keeps on chugging. Chugging. Yes. Opportunity is, is uh, the, the little rover that keeps giving. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, while we're on Mars, I think it would probably only be fitting if we did a curiosity update. Should we go? I think so. And lift off of the Atlas V with curiosity. That was a wheel. Sometimes it ends sooner than I expect. Yeah. I'll be honest. Okay, Heather, what are we talking about for curiosity? Alrighty, we're coming out of our uh, uh, conjunction where it was, you know, Mars was on the other side of the sun. Mm -hmm. And now it is stopped and it has, you know, kind of getting recalibrated and getting moving and actually stopped and they got a uh, self-portrait, a new updated one from the sort of represent the, you know, they drilled into the second rock a week or two ago. So they actually went through and they took sort of a self picture, you know, he hung up. <laughs> this thing takes up the more camera. selfies than I do. I mean, I don't, I mean, I can't believe what he pictures. This is really only the second. Oh, well, by, by definition is more selfies than I do. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I know lots of people who take lots more. And it's one of those things where you don't see the arm. And so, of course, conspiracy says, Hey, is there some, it's got to be fake because that would require someone being there and taking the picture. Right. But it's a whole bunch of different pictures mashed together and they hold the arm in different ways. So you kind of take, you know, pictures, you know, lay them on top of where the arm was 
and splice them all together. Quite and they they taken some and then they had to retake a few more pictures to sort of um, update for the new uh, where they drilled into the rock. So they took a picture of that specific rock that had oh, yeah. the two holes. So if you look uh, in the lower left section yeah, yeah, of yeah. the picture, you can see like the two holes drilled into that rock. Yeah, totally. I found it funny where they went back and they're like, wait, we need a new picture right there. It's going to be exciting. And actually, we will have some science announced this week. They have some radiation readings that they're going to announce. It's going to be on Thursday, May 30th. So next week on SciBite, I will have more information about ground radiation levels. Oh, and uh, maybe then we'll have the final answer on the mutants from Mars. Radiate, radioactive mutants from Mars. All right, uh-huh. Heather, why don't, why don't you jump in the time machine? I've got it all gassed up, ready for a okay. long run. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're not going to run it. Wait a minute. No. Wait, are we ready? Is the time machine broken? It only took us yep. to two years ago, uh, May 25th, 2011. What happened this week in science, Heather? This crazy little science show started showing up. What? I know on this on this awesome cool site like uh, website network, uh, Jupiter Broadcasting. Never heard of it. Yeah, I know they're really cool though. And some little science nerd had shown up on some of their shows a couple of times, <laughs> and then they said, "Hey, want to do a show?" Question mark. And that was two years ago. And I see, so that way we wouldn't get in trouble. I went out and I recorded this for my daughter's music box. Oh my gosh. So it's legit. We can't get pulled <laughs> down. This, it's totally legit. And I got the, the bands here. They're sauced up. There's the mic. Turned on their mic. Hey guys, say hi to Heather. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, it's our, yeah, it's our, our two year. Yeah, no, our yeah. two year. Yeah, it's great. So they're here. All right, all right, you guys. Okay. Right, turn off the mic. All right, so that's the, the band. Okay. They're having a party. They're having a great time. How, how cool is that? That was actually, was, yeah. this Saturday was the official day, right? Yeah, I totally didn't realize, like, passed right by. I've been <laughs> focusing, you know, I am the goal of episode 100. And my husband's like, when did your shoot for a show start? And I was like, when did it? He's like, I think you just passed two years. And I was like, wait, go to the website, check the date. I did. It sneaks up on us. It just it snuck does. right up. Yeah, that happens quite a bit. All right. Well, that's awesome and great work, Heather. It's been two years of awesome science updates, and it's been fun to watch some of these stories over the two years develop, yeah. you know, where they get, hey, this thing is a thing, and we think this is something to watch, to, hey, this is the result, and it's it's been a few things like that. It's been pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Let me recalibrate the side by 2000 so we can look up into the sky this week. Yes. Uh, Venus and Jupiter. Talked about them last week, getting closer and closer, and- Today actually was their closest, only one degree apart. That's one pinky finger held at arm's length. They're still going to be pretty close to each other. So you can still go out and look at them about uh, just after, about 45 minutes after twilight sunset time. time. And to the northwest, you'll be able to see them both together. If you want to check out Saturn around twilight, look to the southeast. Another bright star will be near it, Spica. Uh, Spica, the giant blue star, will be to its upper right, and Saturn will be to its to the lower left. So Saturn, the planet, will be closer to Earth because it's more grounded as a planet. Mm, very, good. very good. And that's so that's about pretty much it is. Is the planet's kind of star in this week? Okay. All right. Good job. Well, Saturn's always fun. Yeah. All right, Heather. Well, very very nice. I believe that brings us to the end of this week's episode, doesn't it? I think so. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, well then, if that wraps us up, there's just a few things I'd like to tell you about. SciBite is live on Tuesdays over at jblive.tv at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. And then it's available for download Wednesday mornings over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Don't forget we have RSS feeds so you can grab the show weekly. And then you don't even have to worry about it. Heather, thanks for the great show. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this week's episode of SciBite. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>